All right, next up on our agenda is Gerard Holtzman of Nimble Research presenting on an interactive code analysis with the COBRA tool. And Gerard, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to tell you about a tool I started developing at JPL. Uh, this was um, at the tail end of the Mars Science Lab mission, the Curiosity rover. Um, and it was meant to uh, solve a problem that we had in dealing with um, um, code review process, the efficiency of the code review process, and uh, dealing with anomalies. So um, let me give you this example of um, uh, a scenario. So in this case, it is the Marsh Science Lab. This is an actual thing that uh, we encountered. It was a post-release anomaly in flight during cruise. And uh, a manual analysis of the software reveals that the, that the cause is that there is a function call that passes an array uh, with, an, with the wrong size, a different size than the function definition expects. So the function expects an array of 16 elements. The caller passes an array of eight elements. And that means there is data corruption. Now, the question is, where else in the code uh, does that happen? And by the way, there's about 3 million lines of code. Uh, so a manual analysis is not likely to reveal much. Um, you can add a checker. We were using uh, a number of different static source code analyzers, uh, a couple of commercial ones and a couple of uh, research prototypes. Uh, so you can write a checker for that exact um, type of uh, problem and see if the checker uh, will, will detect it somewhere else in the code. Uh, and by the way, the, the, the initial surprise is, of course, that the compiler doesn't catch that. The compiler, um, uh, standard compilers, really don't do a lot of checking in, um, across files. If you declare something in one file and uh, declare it as an extern in another file, it doesn't even check that the types are consistent. So here, this, this also slips by uh, existing compilers. So you, you can write a checker. Uh, if you do that, we were running um, uh, uh, integration builds every night for uh, the software, and we were running all the static source code analyzers overnight. That process towards the end of um, the design period, the software implementation period, started taking about 15 hours. So you can wait for the overnight analysis and was already starting to stretch the limits of what you can do overnight. Um, but meanwhile, there, there might be a ticking time bomb, right? So may, maybe that problem is somewhere else in the code and it, it could blow up uh, before you get a chance to discover that. So um, that leads you to this, this question of trying to figure out why does it take so long to do the static source code analysis, especially with the, the commercial systems who are very, very good. So the, the systems are very thorough. They can catch a lot of stuff without ever compiling or executing the code, just looking at um, the, the source code. So here, here is roughly what happens. So you get a few million lines of code, you do pre-processing on that code, you do a lexical analysis, and then you do a whole bunch of stuff, uh, building up sex syntax trees, parse the code, uh, make sure that it is syntactically correct. You build control flow graphs, you do pointer alias analysis, symbol tables, etc. So a lot of stuff there is pre-computed uh, <clears throat> to be available if we wanna check any of these properties. So once we have all that data uh, compiled, we can run a host of checkers. We can run hundreds and hundreds of checks over that code using the pre-computed information. So if we have the new checker, for instance, for the problem I just uh, outlined, uh, you can add it to the mix and 15 hours later, uh, you have your result. And then of course you can do the fix. You have to repeat the whole process, make sure it's gone, uh, et cetera. So now if you look at, you know, where is the time spent? Where does all the time go? Uh, it, it really goes to this middle part where we compute a lot of information that may or may not be needed for whatever we want to check. So there's always at least one check that, that needs like, like pointer alias analysis or something like the, the, the control flow graphs. Uh, most of the other checks don't need that. So 
with this particular check that we wanted to do, 90% of that stuff that is pre-computed was not needed. So that leads to the question, what if, what if you skip that? But okay, all the time goes there. You can try to do a configuration like only compute this and not that, but say we skip that completely and we just plug in an analyzer right after the lexical analysis phase. This seems like a really dumb idea, right? So it seems like, well, why would you do that? Uh, the big thing you, you win is efficiency, speed. So the question is, um, how useful is that? How far can you push that? So I started pursuing that particular project uh, at JPL. Uh, we got a very interesting prototype of the tool. We had a public release of the tool. It's now uh, uh, available under uh, uh, public release from GitHub. Uh, and I'll describe uh, the types of things that you can do with the tool, which is, uh, to the least, uh, it is interesting. I hope at least I can convince you that it is uh, really interesting. Um, this is roughly the context. Source code comes in, we do lexical analysis, we get a token stream out of that. We put that in a database. The Cobra tool allows you to query that database. So you can type uh, queries against that database, no matter how big it is. So uh, you can take the entire Linux distribution of whatever it is by now, 10 million lines of code, uh, put it in the database and type queries against that and get the responses to every query in under a second. So you get interactive response time and you can resolve these queries of the problem that I, I outlined at the start. So the data structure is a linked list. So, and that's it, it's extremely simple, but it's also important that it is a linked list. So it's laid out in memory linearly from start to finish, say 3 million lines of code, starting with the first lexical token. So the Cobra, the preprocessor for Cobra does a number of steps to make it easier to interrogate the token screen, stream. So it, it'll do lexical token categorization. Every token gets a category, like this is a data type, this is an identifier, this is a keyword, et cetera. This is a round brace, curly brace. And, and it, it performs some uh, annotations like uh, matching brace pairs. So we're, we're gonna assume that the code is syntactically correct, like it, it, it compiles, right? So we don't have to deal with our missing uh, uh, bra brace in a brace pair. So it connects brace pairs, uh, curly braces, round braces, and then it allows you to interrogate things in between, say, curly braces by querying a set. So the, the set of tokens in between these brace pairs becomes a set that you can query. Um, so now what, what makes it fast? What makes it fast? For one reason is when you read in all the code, which you can do in parallel on multiple cores. Once you've read in all the code, you have a linear, linear sequence in memory that you want to interrogate by running checkers over that linked list. And that is extremely cache friendly, right? So you read in a cache line and you scan through that cache line, you read in the next one. It is optimally fast. Uh, so that's, that's how we get that performance. If you want to push that even further and you have a multi-core system, so you have 32 cores, 128 cores available, you simply split that data stream, that lexical token linked list uh, into N pieces. You have N cores, N pieces, you query them in parallel. So you get almost a linear speed up when you do that. Not quite because of other effects, but uh, almost a linear speed up. Source code comes in, populate the database, can query it in parallel, outcome patterns of interest. Now the queries you can uh, issue to this tool are of, of different types. You can do pattern matching on lex lexical tokens, uh, comparable to tools like grep, um, which do pattern matching on character strings. So this does pattern matching on lexical tokens, which, which makes a huge difference and can use the fact that brace, brace pairs are, are always correctly matched at the right level of nesting. Um, you can do interactive queries. So you, you, can, you can type a pattern and it finds matches to the pattern, or you can interactively query, query the code by uh, defining sets of interesting tokens in a particular context and home in one particular uh, suspicious touch of um, uh, uh, code. 
or you can write uh, uh, scripts in a powerful uh, inline scripting language that, that supports definition of functions, functions, associative arrays, the recursive functions, um, and etc. So, so you, you can do uh, a lot of stuff uh, uh, querying this code. Now for, for time, since I don't have uh, a lot of time, I'll talk just about pattern matching because that is kind of cool. And I don't know of many other tools that can do something similar and can do it as efficiently as this tool can. So I'll give you just a couple of examples. So uh, pattern matching on lexical tokens instead of on character strings. So to find vulnerabilities in code or, or to, to check coding rules. Uh, many of us, many, many of the projects that we're all involved in use the MISRA rules for checking safety and, and, and uh, uh, coding practices for, for a project. Uh, about 50% of the MISRA coding rules can be captured in, uh, in this tool. And so either with matching patterns or by um, writing in, uh, interactive queries that you can define in scripts or by, by you doing programming with the inline programming language. So here's one example that you shouldn't declare a variable static uh, uh, locally within a function. You can look for this particular pattern, which is, uh, you know, it's just round brace saying, well, it's the end of the parameter list of, uh, of the function. There's the body of the function. The keyword static should not appear in the middle of that function. Dot star is the usual notation for regular expressions. So dot matches any token. Dot star says any sequence of tokens of zero or more uh, tokens. The curly braces here. So I have this curly brace open, curly brace close uh, because it, the, the brace matching is pre-computed. These are guaranteed to match at the same level of nesting. So this is truly checking function definitions. Here's a second one where we now use a different operator uh, uh, up arrow for negation. So this checks for uh, the body of a for statement not uh, being defined as a compound statement, meaning enclosed in curly braces. So we use the keyword for open round brace, the matching close round brace with dot star in between, meaning any, we don't care what's, what's in the control part of the for loop. And then anything other than a curly brace would be a violation also of a, a MISAR rule. Here's a slightly more interesting MISA rule uh, violation that says any else if chain must end with a final else. So that's similar to a switch statement that must have a default clause. Uh, is because if you if you omit the default clause or you omit the final else in this else if chain, you may miss a case. Right? There's a condition that's not being uh, uh, handled. So here, extremely easy to specify keyword else, keyword if, then any condition, we don't care what it is, so dot star, uh, then anything in the body, the then part of the if statement, which should be in curly braces, because another Misha role uh, uh, makes sure that that is the case. And then at the end, we see anything other than an else after the closing brace of one of these uh, uh, blocks. Anything other than else, immediate violation. This is rather simple to type. Um, I'll give uh, uh, one more, uh, well, two more examples. Here's one more example where we use uh, name binding, variable binding. And so here it, we want to check for a, a reverse null problem that uh, you test um, a, a pointer variable for being null. But earlier in the code, you've dereferenced that same pointer variable. So how do we know it's a pointer variable? In general, you would need the symbol table, look up the name within the scope, et cetera. Uh, but it's actually with a pattern, uh, you can solve this very simply by saying, well, any identifier followed by an arrow is being dereferenced, that has to be a pointer. And so now we want to remember the name of that variable, which is uh, we will now bind to the variable X, a meta variable X, X colon, uh, uh, and then uh, token in the category of identifier. So at sign ident matches any token in that category. And we remember the name of uh, that identifier, that pointer variable in the, the meta variable X. And then any code laser, so dot star. So we don't care. There could be a lot of lines of code 
later within the same block, like the other curly braces, make sure that it's all in the same block. Then we see a test for null. And now, so here actually you see forward slash equals, and that is an embedded regular expression that checks for any lexical token that contains an equal sign in it. So uh, it, it, uh, since it's an if, it's, it's a condition, it could be greater than or equal, less than or equal, double equal, not equal. So it's a comparison against null. Uh, so this and then anything else after it. So that's um, a, a reverse null test. And that would be a problem because either uh, the pointer cannot be null in the, in the second part in the test, or if it can be null there, it can also be null at the dereference and that will be a crash. Last example uh, is uh, using a few more of these uh, features and showing that you can actually do interesting things. For instance, checking whether a function that can return zero can be used in the denominator of a division. So uh, here we have a, a type followed by an identifier, followed by uh, something in round braces. So this is a function definition. After that is the body of the function. We want to remember the name of that function. So at sign type matches any type, but including void or int or, or anything. Then um, the name of the function, which we're going to remember in variable x, then anything in the parameter list. And then in the body, we have to see the two token uh, sequence return zero. That means it can return zero. No, no matter what else happens, it could possibly return zero. And then dot star uh, sometime later uh, in a different function, right? We're now outside the function. Somewhere else in a different function, we see a division operator, forward slash, followed by a call to that function. So that same name, now the, 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 the reference to that bound name is colon x by anything in the parameter list. And so that's, that's a guaranteed crash. If you do that on the Linux code base, surprisingly, you get a couple of matches. So it's a, it's a non-trivial test and not that hard to come up with these tests. Now, in this case, I've shown you all these examples from the command line. So minus p is uh, for pattern expression. We type a pattern expression and apply it to code like star.c, star.ch or whatever. You can also do a, a recursive option where you say, collect all the .c files or any, any file that matches this particular regular expression like .c and .ch, .y in the current directory or below it, and then apply uh, the, the, the match against all those files. You can also more, more fruitfully and efficiently do this in an interactive session. And it means you first read in all the code and now you have it in memory. And now you can do the, the search across that code. So here, these are the, the same five uh, examples, but now in an interactive session, main, meaning it's still faster because we only have one penalty for reading in all the code. So if you have like 10 million lines of code and you use a single core, it may take you know, 20 minutes to read in all that code. The lexical analysis itself doesn't take much time, but just reading it from this uh, takes a bit of time. You can do that in parallel with say 32 cores, 32 data streams, speeds it up considerably, uh, still probably coming from the same disk. So it's not, not a, a total in linear speed up in that case. So here you can type these queries one by one and each one of them will complete in under a second, uh, depending on how many cores you're gonna use. Uh, there are a few uh, things that I, I'll point out. So this is just sort of the tip of the iceberg to get you interested that this tool is actually uh, uh, handy to have around during code review or for uh, an anomaly analysis. Uh, you can define additional constraints on token attributes. Uh, you can define matches, especially if you do this interactively in sets, and then you can do set operations, like you take the union of two sets, the, the difference, the intersection of sets, et cetera. And you can generate output in JSON format. Uh, the tool can also read JSON formatted uh, files from other tools produced by other tools to see pattern sets that you can then interrogate uh, further. So let me give you a little bit of a view of the performance. Of course, single core will be the slowest. And this way is 18 million lines of code from the Linux 4.3 distribution. 
about 40,000 lines, uh, .c uh, files. And we'll do two queries like find empty else statements. Uh, surprisingly, this is a common thing. So else followed by a semicolon uh, or find switch statements without a default clause. So here is the performance. So the, the top line is the startup, like reading in all the code and uh, doing it on either a single core, which takes about two minutes in this case, or using multiple cores and then it drops down to about 30 seconds. If it were a linear speed up, it would be the dotted line. But of course, we since all the code comes from the same disk, uh, that's hard to get. Uh, and then the query responses. So green is find MTLs clauses, so the two tokens in, in sequence. And the red is uh, find default, uh, find switch statements without a default clause. And you see the moment you start using four cores or more, and this is on a slow system. This was a Ubuntu system with 32 cores that I had uh, a couple of years ago, 1.4 gigahertz per core. Uh, so the, even on that relatively slow system, you have interactive performance the moment you use four or more cores. So that makes it uh, uh, interesting to, to have very spat. And you can imagine sitting in a code review session and you want to type queries and uh, get responses, like resolve issues that come up during the code review, or as you're developing the code, oh, I realized I just did something wrong. Uh, where else in the code did I do that? You can set this up even uh, to say, well, you come up with a new type of vulnerability, scan all the code anywhere on my disk. You may have many millions of lines of code sitting around on your disk. You, you collect all the .c files in a single file and you run Cobra with the query over that list and you find all the code you wrote like 20 years ago that has these vulnerabilities. So that's it. Um, so uh, current version of Cobra is uh, 3.8. Uh, you can find the code on GitHub uh, in uh, nimble code slash Cobra. Um, it's uh, fast, it's free, and hopefully it is uh, not too difficult to use. There are lots of tutorials online in this website here at the top, spinroot.com slash Cobra. Um, and there, the tool comes with uh, lots of rule libraries that you can use like for the MISO uh, rules, for the JPL coding standard, and uh, we're continuing to work on extending that set. That's what I have. Thank you so much. Um, we do have time, I think, for one brief question. Uh, we do have several uh, online. First question from Leonidas Cosmitis. Uh, does Cobra work on pre-processed source code and as if all the input files are merged together? Uh, you have the option of, on the command line saying run the preprocess, the C preprocessor first. And so you can do that. You can also do that separately and you know produce preprocess code and then run Cobra on that. But Cobra can do that internally as well. You can also turn that on during an interactive uh, session. Uh, what I didn't mention is that the tool itself is language agnostic. So uh, by default, it, it knows about C. So it knows the lexical tokens for C code. You can also tell it to run on C++ code, on ADA code, on Python code, um, and a number of other languages, Java code. So, and it just means that the lexical analyzer does different uh, uh, types of categorization. If you come up with your own language, like uh, Go or, or uh, uh, any other uh, type of language, Rust, uh, you can define your own lexical anal and lexical token mapping and provide that map to, to, to Cobra so that it can also handle these other languages. Wonderful. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time for questions we have. Uh, there are several more uh, on Zoom that we'll move over to the Slack if you have uh, time to join us over there. Okay. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time. And uh, next up on the agenda, we've got another break. Uh, we'll be resuming at about 3.55 p.m. Eastern time. Uh,